great introduction. Thank you so much. I'm so honored to be here this morning and to return to South Africa. It's my third time here, but it's been a few years. As I understand, it's been a few years since you've been able to get together uh, in person. So I've traveled in uh, yesterday from Singapore, where I live, and it is a port state that lies at a very important confluence of two bodies of water, the Indian Ocean and the Pacific Ocean, on the strategic Straits of Malacca. Sometimes I think of myself as just a moving dot on a map. Now that COVID is over, we get to travel again. I set my iPhone default home screen to Google Earth, and I just follow that dot. And when it takes me here to where we are now, it just makes me deeply appreciate the power of geography. In Singapore, we know that we sit at this strategic confluence of two great oceans, and here, at the tip of this incredibly mighty continent of Africa, you sit at the confluence of the Atlantic Ocean, the Indian Ocean, and actually what scientists have now separately demarcated and designated as an Arctic, uh, Antarctic Ocean. So three incredibly important uh, bodies of water come together here, and as a geographer, I can't help but feel that energy, feel that power the same way that I do when I'm at home in Singapore. So as introduced, I focus on geopolitics, geography, all things geo. And so to begin a conversation about geopolitics today, I thought I would start with some geometry, because I've replaced the map with this diagram that really is full of various shapes and relations, dyads, lines, connections between those shapes. And that's another good way of understanding the changing nature of geopolitics. Not just the geographic lens, but the connections across those geographies as represented here. Now, the big paradigm shift of several that have occurred over the last several decades, and even the last several years, can be summed up in this way. A transition from a unipolar world to a multipolar world, from a geopolitical monopoly to a geopolitical marketplace. And this, to me, is the common point of departure assumption from which we need to uh, look ahead into the future to understand the world. We need to get on the same page, and this diagram helps us with that. Now, if we were debating whether or not the world is still unipolar or not, you would presume, as a lot of those conversations suggest, that geopolitical history is a transition from one dominant hegemonic power, Britain, the United States, perhaps next China, from one to the other to the other. And therefore, there would be some flag at the center of that uh, prism in the middle. But there isn't, because in a multipolar world, in a marketplace, there isn't one power in a, that gets to call all the shots, that gets to tell everyone else what they can and cannot do, who they can and cannot relate with, whether it's military alliances and arms deals, whether it's trade and financial relationships, commercial arrangements, technology partnerships, and so on and so forth. So we have to get used to this idea not that the world of tomorrow, the world of 2030, 2040, 2050 will eventually become a multipolar world, a geopolitical marketplace, but that it has already become one. And not only that, this is a very almost rigid foundation. It's not going to change. There is not going to be one power that will come along and take over the world and establish itself as the new single ordering principle for the future. It will not be the United States and it will not be China. It will be neither. Instead, what I'm showing you here is a world in which, really for the first time in history, every region of the world actually matters. They are on the map, so to speak. There are hierarchies, there are inequalities, there are imbalances, but in a non-colonial way, right, in a non-hegemonic way, every region, every continent actually matters and can associate generally freely with each other because there isn't one power that can say no. And that's what we're witnessing every single day, example after example after example. I'm going to show you a lot of that. So the dynamics of a geopolitical marketplace are such that 
Every region, every continent matters, yes. There are certain states that are the anchors within. I'm showing you, for example, of course, uh, Brazil as the key power, of course, of uh, South America. I'm showing you, of course, the South African flag here, along with Nigeria and others as, one of the, as the anchors of uh, Africa. And the United States, of course, is the most powerful state in North America. No surprises there. But within that context, they also relate to each other in a way that is non-hegemonic, that is very competitive. And that's the way we think about a marketplace. Anyone in finance, anyone operating a business understands that you're competing in a marketplace. And geopolitics can be thought of in much the same way. Well, the great powers are competing to be the resource providers, to provide certain utilities, certain public goods. If it's uh, finance, it's the role of the dollar. If it's the military, protection of the sea lanes in some maritime areas, it's the United States, but you're starting to see China, India, and others assert themselves as well in the security domain. When it comes to infrastructure, this is an area that's been neglected by the West for decades, and so you see that China has filled that void and has become a leading provider of that public good, if you will, of infrastructure, something that, in fact, the United Nations and the Sustainable Development Goals, Millennium Development Goals, and that process over decades, they've come to recognize infrastructure as something of a global public good, and it is not the United States that's the de facto provider of it. In technology, in uh, environmental regulation, in clean technology, and so on and so forth, in every single domain that you think of as a utility Right, something that your country, your region needs, there is more than one vendor in that marketplace. There is not one de facto standard or, uh, or uh, provider that you must use. And this intense, relentless, and again, uh, interminable competition among not just one, two, perhaps three, four, five, six different powers and regions, that is the fluidity that constitutes a geopolitical marketplace. And this is not something that we should continue to say we are anticipating for tomorrow or some distant time. That's the world of now. It's also, I believe, going to be the world of 2030, 2040, and beyond. Now, I did say that within this globally distributed uh, marketplace structure, there are some hierarchy. Some powers, some regions do, of course, matter, quote unquote, or have more gravity than others. And indeed, it's true that you could say that from an economic standpoint, the world is tripolar regionally, North America, Europe, and Asia. Now, looking at the differences between the structure of the world economy and the dynamics among the major regions and powers, comparing, say, 15 years ago during the global financial crisis and today, is quite instructive. Fifteen years ago, you noticed that how, whether it was um, finance ministries, central banks, the international financial institutions, coordinated to try to jumpstart, to resume global supply chains, global trade, to bring about what we, in retrospect, view as synchronized economic recovery and growth. That is not what has happened during and after COVID, right? It's much more about key powers and their regional neighbors and allies deciding to focus on uh, how to nearshore supply chains, pursue industrial policies, strengthen local and regional connections, uh, perhaps at the expense, if you will, of a synchronized global economic recovery. And that's what we're starting to see play out. In fact, you can trace this to before COVID, but certainly during COVID. It was before COVID with the launch of the trade wars by the Trump administration against China, that you started to see North America consolidate. On the eve of COVID, for example, the United States was already trading more with China, sorry, more with Canada, and more with Mexico, bilaterally each, than it was with China before COVID. Right. In fact, during COVID, uh, you had, given the supply chain disruptions, a bit of an increase in the trade deficit between the U.S. and China. But the continuation of industrial policy, nearshoring, and other measures that we're witnessing right now demonstrate that there is this regional consolidation uh, going on. And uh, the nearshoring story is a big driver of that. In Europe, which already enjoyed the largest 
region, share that any region has of internal trade as a share of total trade. You've witnessed during COVID the fiscal compact and other measures towards, again, a regional-wide uh, industrial policy and other, other green subsidies and measures to, uh, to consolidate the regional economies. You had Brexit, but you've not had other countries uh, exit uh, the, the, the European Union and certainly not the Eurozone. In Asia, interestingly enough, as much as we've talked about the world fragmenting and so on, Asia has been coming together. It may not have been noticed here, and it was almost ignored in North America and in Europe, but the single largest regional trade agreement in history was ratified during COVID, the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership in Asia, with um, encompassing the largest, a uh, huge number of Asian countries. India did not join, but may perhaps join in a future round. And what you've witnessed over the past 25 years, since the Asian financial crisis of 90, 1997, 1998, is that Asians have learned from these crises to, again, deepen their internal regional consolidation, to make themselves a whole greater than the sum of their parts. Whenever there have been those crises, whether it is the Asian financial crisis, 10 years later the global financial crisis, the nationalism and protectionist measures of Trump and Brexit, and then COVID, every time there's been a shock to the Asian system, countries have said, what are we going to do to compensate? How can we increase our internal trade with each other? Uh, how can we reform and liberalize and open up to each other more? How can we integrate our supply chains? Step by step by step, they have learned from those and come back stronger. And that's the story very much of Asia today. And despite the geopolitical tensions that exist among the great powers of Asia, whether it's China and India, China and uh, Japan and others, you find that their uh, economic ties continue to remain quite uh, intense. And now you also have the question of Russia and geopolitics. Now, in the previous slide, you may have seen that the Russian flag was nestled in the periphery of Europe. I'm not sure that's where I would put it anymore. And we're going to come back to that in just a moment when we think about where the geometry of power intersects with the geographical realities. Before we do, one other point around the big shifts in geopolitics and their economic underpinnings from the previous generation, let's call it the Cold War era, to the world of today. That should no longer really be called the post-Cold War era because it really has been 30 years. So it's time for a new name and we're going to experiment or play around with some of that nomenclature uh, this morning. But sticking with this tripolar set of regional economic anchors, Many of us grew up in that world where the transatlantic relationship, the relationship between the United States and Europe, or North America and Europe, was really the axis that defined the world economy, represented the largest share of global GDP, and even trade. Today, that's not what the world looks like. You can see that actually North America is, in a way, the most autarkic, the most self-sufficient of the major regional powers. And this is, this is crucial in geopolitics. Uh, geopolitics ever since the 19th century has not actually necessarily been about the pursuit of externalizing your military capabilities and conquering your neighbors. Actually, in the 19th century, the origins of geopolitics lie in the quest for self-sufficiency, even autarky, from troubles in other parts of the world. What is your land area, your natural resource endowments, your population size, your industrial capacity, the size, uh, of course, of your military and other kinds of uh, factors. And so being autarkic, being self-sufficient is actually a goal. It it's comprises victory in some ways. But it also means that by virtue of only representing 14% of total global trade, the U.S. has less leverage, actually, on how others deal with each other than it thinks it does. I often get asked, this was at least during the Trump administration, if you could show, or if you had five minutes with Donald Trump, what would you tell him? I said, well, I, I presume he doesn't like to read a lot, so I might just show him a map. <laughs> and of the many maps that I have in my uh, arsenal, this is the one that I would show him. I would say, sure, the United States is still uh, the world's first or second largest economy, but its leverage is a lot less than it thinks. And time and time again, when you see Washington tell uh, allied countries that should not join the Trans-Pacific Partnership, for example, which it did. They go ahead and they do it anyway. Told European countries, don't join the uh, Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank that China founded. Well, they did it anyway. Don't join the Belt and Road Initiative. Some of them did it anyway. Why? Well, the answer is right here on this very, very simple map. Because Europe, 
uh, represents, uh, again, about one-third of total global trade, more than the United States, is much more dependent on it, and look at these connecting lines across the three mega regions. The world has moved from that transatlantic era to a Eurasian one. Europe trades more with Asia than it does the United States, and that's precisely happened during this past generation, in this post-Cold War period. So Europeans think in a mercantile fashion, right, in a commercial fashion, and they make their foreign policy decisions uh, based upon looking at uh, data like this, and their largest trade partner um, is, uh, is indeed, uh, has become China, or China's largest trading partner uh, is the European Union. And so this trans-Eurasian trade, if you look at these three lines, ask yourself which one is going to grow the most in the coming 5, 10, 15 years? Is it going to be the transatlantic relationship to anemic, demographically plateauing, heavily indebted regions? Or is it going to be the relationship between Europe and Asia where, you know, uh, they share this mega continent of Eurasia. As a geographer, I always get offended when, when I recall how children in school are taught that the world has these distinct continents of Africa, South America, North America, Europe, Asia, Australia. It's like, hold on, stop, stop, stop. Europe and Asia are not separate continents, right? They share this gigantic geological formation known as Eurasia. There are different regions on a megacontinent. And if you think about all of the investments in infrastructure and trade, trade agreements that are taking place, right, uh, which one is going to grow the fastest? It's, of course, the one that's already the largest, which is the Eurasian relationship, which is why, again, we can pull from the news. We can look at how Macron just went to Beijing, Embarrassed himself, yes, but he went, right, over objections from his own peers and, uh, and certainly the United States. Uh, Olaf Scholz, Chancellor of Germany, where was he relatively recently? China, separate trips to Asian capitals. Europeans are going to Asia all the time, whether they're cutting their own deals, whether they're doing it in a coordinated fashion, is secondary to the fact that this is the data they look at. They vote with their wallets. So, the future of the world economy is most certainly centered more on Eurasia than it is on the traditional transatlantic domain. Again, that is a fact of today and of tomorrow, not some emergent, long-term, distant uh, prospect or scenario. Now, I mentioned Asia coming together and learning from, from crises, and I just wanted to show you how important this is uh, for, of course, this, this continent itself, Africa, but as a lesson in how you, again, become a whole greater than the sum of your parts. If you go back historically, uh, by which I mean either uh, thousands of years or even the pre-colonial era, um, Asians used to trade more with each other than they did with other regions, but it took 30 years after the uh, end of the Cold War and, of course, after centuries of colonialism for these connections between nations and sub-regions to really rekindle, and now, much like Europe, Asians trade much more with each other than they do with the rest of the world. And that is an extremely important source of resilience when you have global trade wars, geopolitical frictions, supply chains cut off because of COVID, right? To have to be able to rely on your neighbors and to be able to draw from them when necessary is, is absolutely vital and fundamental. And as you well know, intra-African trade is not nearly as high as it could be and should be, and we're going to come back to that. So every single line on this map, whether it's the relationship between the Gulf economies and China or Japan or with India, Southeast Asian economies and their ties with Central Asia or Russia or uh, Saudi Arabia, every one of these, you can go back 15 years, 10 years, 5 years, today. That's what I did. And every one of them, the numbers are going up, right? Asia is stitching itself back together again. A lot of people refer to this as the new Silk Roads, for example. We'll come back to that. I call it simply the Asianization of Asia. And that's a bit of a mouthful, but that's technically what is going on. And I think we'll look back decades from now and say that the greatest economic story, maybe even civilizational story, or, or certainly economically of the last uh, generation, is not the rise of China. It's the Asianization of Asia. And China is an enormous part of that story, a huge driver of that story. China sits at the middle, and again, every one of these lines surrounding China has increased in volume as well. But it isn't the full Asian story. In fact, Asia uh, is much larger than just China, demographically and economically. And this comes back to a point about geopolitics and the power transitions. So the first point I'll make is this. When World War II ended, 
and the world was unmistakably unipolar with the United States as the world's sole superpower, it represented 50% of global GDP. Important historical reminder for everyone. That's 50, that's five zero. That's never going to be replicated ever again. And that's part of what being a unipolar hegemon meant and was and underpinned it. China today represents 15, that's a one five percent of global GDP. That's not going up to 50, right? I'm sure we could probably all agree on that. So that's one. So again, China is right here, in, shown in purchasing power parity terms, already the world's largest economy. I don't think anyone should dispute that. But it's embedded in this much larger uh, Asian mega region that represents already more than half the world uh, population and about 50% of global uh, GDP. So this Asian mega region, again, looking not just at geography, but the meaning of geography, how we color code countries, what I've witnessed in the last couple of uh, decades is countries that we used to think of as aspiring to join the West, connecting to the West, seeing their, even their political, diplomatic, institutional future with the West are now tilting a bit more towards Asia. And therefore you see Russia, hmm, I've painted it orange, right? It used to be more of that European uh, tint. Ditto for Turkey and other uh, countries as well whose orientation has changed and you can see it in the numbers. Who are they trading with? Where is their investment coming from? Uh, and uh, what are even their, their, again, diplomatic institutional relationships? A country like Turkey, for example, uh, is considering becoming a member of the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, which is meeting uh, day after tomorrow in Goa, in India. And that would be the first NATO member, which is, as you know, a Western alliance, to be a member of also what people think of as the NATO of the East. I think in Brussels and Washington, heads are going to explode uh, if and when that happens. But this is how countries play uh, this game of what I call multi-alignment in this geopolitical marketplace. They play all sides, they look around, they say, who are we going to, to deal with uh, the most? Now, Africa, as in purchasing power parity terms as a share of the global economy, is of course much smaller than these three mega regions, but I do see that the anchor states, including, of course, South Africa, Nigeria, Kenya, and others, are also looking in all directions and saying, who are we going to relate with and to achieve our interests? So let's talk a bit about that. You may have seen maps like this if you spend too much time on, on Twitter. Uh, I don't know if Elon Musk takeover conditions you for or against spending more time on Twitter. I don't recommend it either way, irrespective of who the owner is. But maps like this make the rounds. This is my rendition of it, which I made um, some years ago to capture how um, China, in a way, opens so many doors for the Asian trade network expansion globally through its investments in infrastructure, through its bilateral arrangements. And it now represents, uh, it is the top trading partner of uh, far more countries in the world than the United States is, more than double uh, as many. But, and I think everyone here in, in Africa is mindful of this, that uh, these connections that represent comparative advantage right, uh, which are obviously beneficial in many ways, uh, can also become dyads of dependence, right, whether it is debt diplomacy, whether it's unequal terms of trade and so forth. So one has to be mindful of, yes, playing all sides, but not being overly dependent in one direction or the other. Again, a huge generational shift. Many African countries for generations were, of course, much more tied, tethered to um, to Europe, for example. When I was a teenager and a university student, all the talk about Africa was really about whether or not Europe would reform its common agricultural policy. And if Europe doesn't reform its common agricultural policy, well then, Africa is gonna have a hard time developing and modernizing. Today, that looks like a fairly quaint or antiquated kind of conversation, right? The future of Africa hinges on a lot more than whether or not Europe reforms its uh, policies. And, and, and of course it should, uh, and, and, and incrementally it might, but Africa has started to look in all directions as every single power uh, should do. Now, this brings us also to Belt and Road, which I mentioned as one of the key uh, initiatives that relates to filling that vacuum of global infrastructure provision that enables and creates greater fluidity in, uh, in global trade, but it also is not a one-way street, right? Uh, it started out about 10 years ago, actually, a speech that uh, Xi Jinping gave in Kazakhstan and emerged as a multi-regional set of uh, infrastructural uh, relationships, uh, but 
it, and it was portrayed as almost a one-way ticket towards Chinese global you know, domination. But in fact, China too is reallocated, and you have to be very careful about uh, those trends. Whereas, uh, in fact, uh, Chinese foreign investment into Africa and Belt and Road projects, as well as other regions and continents like South America, has been going down. Its investments in West Asian countries, uh, like Saudi Arabia, like Iran, has gone way up. And you can see that in the diplomacy, of course. It was widely reported uh, just a few weeks ago that China had brokered this diplomatic handshake between Iran and Saudi Arabia. Well, that's the result of more than five years of shifting capital allocation, right, that China has been diligently engaging in. You might even say at the expense of Africa, at the expense of South America, at the expense of Europe. So again, even if you have cordial ties with China, even if the terms of trade are mutually uh, beneficial, even if there's complementarity there, always be mindful that in a geopolitical marketplace, right, nothing is, uh, should be taken for granted, right? There is very little loyalty uh, in, in this world, right? One day you're loyal to one brand for a television or a car, well, you can easily switch to the next one. That's literally how geopolitics works in this marketplace as well. So let's tie some of this together and bring it back to some maps that also integrate Africa into the bigger picture. This incredible story of the Asianization of Asia portrayed on a map looks a bit like this. Because again, if you go back 500 years of colonialism, 50 years of the Cold War, and now three decades since, how Asia has been stitching itself back together through infrastructural connectivity and that helps to unlock the potential of what is the largest population uh, zone in the world. Most of the population of the planet Earth, most of the population of the human species, now and in the future, is inside this rectangle. Just to be absolutely clear, you may be aware that the world population is starting to plateau. We just crossed 8 billion people. The latest forecast suggests the world population is not even going to reach 9 billion people. We're almost at what I call peak humanity, right? And most of the population is going to be Asians living here in this, uh, in this rectangle. And therefore, those investments that have been made, every line on this map, these different colors that you see, looks like a giant spaghetti bowl dumped on a map. Well, they actually represent real infrastructures, real pipelines, railways, internet cables, um, and, and all kinds of other connectivity that is helping these post-colonial countries to unlock their potential. Landlocked countries now get to connect to the world economy. Populations can shift along roads and railways and move into new and emerging cities uh, that are the, the new dynamic hubs of the new Silk Roads. It's all happening in real time. It's been going on for 30 years. Even the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development, Europe off to the west here, really helped to lead this in the 1990s before China was a superpower. Japan was allocating lots of capital towards these projects. And then came China as well, and now others competing in this marketplace, financing this infrastructure, unlocking the potential of these many post-Soviet, post-colonial countries. Again, the lessons here uh, should be very clear, of course, for Africa, and we're going to reinforce them. And then I'll say a word about Russia which again, in FIFA, or last time I was here was for the World Cup <laughs> 12 years ago, so I had FIFA on my mind, whether it's FIFA or the United Nations or the World Bank, Russia always belonged to the European group. Well, if you're a geographer, Russia has always only been in one place. It's always been North Asia. I would bet, raise your hand please, if you've ever heard anyone refer to Russia as North Asia. If you ever even heard the term North Asia, not, not, not many. See, I'll have to go back to school and study geography, please, <laughs> uh, to, just to satisfy me. Now, in geography, there was never any dispute, ever. No two geographers have ever disagreed that Russia is North Asia, even though that doesn't come up a lot in diplomatic and, and uh, global macro conversation. But that's all it's ever been, and that's all it ever will be. Sure, they think of themselves as European. Sure, much of the Russian population is concentrated west of the Ural Mountains. But ever since uh, 2008, their invasion of Georgia, 2014, the seizure of Crimea, to say nothing of the last one year of the full invasion of Ukraine and the war, the increasing isolation of uh, Russia uh, from Western uh, institutions and its tilt towards Asia. Obama famously announced his pivot to Asia when he uh, took office in 2008. And, uh, and, and Putin, in response to that, said, we already tilted to Asia. 
right? He had already said, we're going to be dealing more with China. We're going to be part of Belt and Road. We're going to deepen our Asian trade relationships. And now that's been cemented, de facto, right? Russia, Ru uh, Russian oil is uh, now, and Russian oil and gas uh, imports into Europe have dropped to effectively zero. The trust is gone. It's hard to imagine a scenario in the future where that will be restored. But meanwhile, uh, of course, Asian countries have been embracing Russia because they are much more dependent on its, uh, on its oil and gas and food and other exports. They've been participating in all of these Belt and Road and other infrastructure projects uh, and agreements. And you can see it with the bilateral visits of uh, Xi Jinping to Moscow and uh, vice versa. You can see it in uh, India's proposal of a free trade agreement with Russia just recently. Now again, talk about evidence of a geopolitical marketplace of countries acting in their own interest and free associating. On the one hand, India is increasingly uh, uh, joined at the hip strategically in, the, in East Asia with the United States, who just sent uh, B-2 bombers to fly over the Himalayas in a show of strength to deter China from further incursions into Indian territory. But then one week later, India says, hey, Vladimir, would you like to have a free trade agreement? Right? That's not exactly something that resonates very well in Washington, but there's India saying, we're going to do whatever we want. We're going to do what's our interest. And you can pretty much predict a country's foreign policy by the, by the share of its current account deficit that's represented by, uh, by, by oil and gas imports. Right? And if you're a country like India that uh, has to you know, pay out lots of subsidies to keep people happy and your currency is weak and all of a sudden you see commodities prices spiking, they're not going to play along with any kind of um, you know, what is thought of as an ideological you know, struggle, as legitimate as it of course is, versus Russia. They're going to say, what's, what's in it for us? So free trade agreement proposed with Russia. North-South Silk Road corridors being produced that are also depicted here. Russia connected to the Caucasus, through Iran, to the Arabian Sea. Um, again, it's the new geometry through connectivity across geography that you can witness playing out in this geopolitical uh, marketplace. Now, let's bring in Africa. I've mentioned a couple of times that it's 500 years of colonialism and 50 years of Cold War that have come to an end. So what is the future shape of the global system geopolitically, economically? How is it changing through connectivity? Well, sociologists and scholars who study that pre-colonial world actually have a wonderful term for what the global system looked like before the Western Hemisphere was discovered and settled. And that term is Afro-Eurasia. Anyone student of pre-colonial history? Okay, fine. So, Afro-Eurasia. Well, I think you know what the first four letters represent there, Africa. Africa was, of course, a vital anchor of the Afro, African, European, Asian network, if you will, of both terrestrial and maritime Silk Roads that characterized the world as it was prior to uh, the global colonial system under European hierarchy that lasted for centuries. What we are witnessing today, if you tie together all of these threads, is nothing less than the resurrection, the return of the Afro-Eurasian system, where the lion's share, the vast majority of the world economy, population, new infrastructure investment, new trade networks, are all connecting what really are legitimately ancient and medieval trade routes and, uh, and, um, and, 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 uh, and other networks, really, that, that, that thrive for centuries. So the, this resurrection of Afro-Eurasia, Afro to me, is, again, one of these irrevocable, irrefutable, irreversible stories of the world of today and most certainly of tomorrow. No one power is going to come along and say, no, you cannot do that. Everyone involved in it is willingly participating in it. Some would even say that it is the construction of a post-Western world. Again, to my mind, that goes too far because as I've portrayed it in that first uh, uh, geometrical kind of diagram, uh, the world is multipolar. Every region is important. There's no way that North America ceases to be a superpower region that is a central, vital pillar of the global system. But can the countries on this map, can the Afro-Eurasian powers and players uh, 
create and deepen their relationships, whether it is, again, if you look at the volumes of trade, the, you would say, some would say it's the trade across emerging and frontier markets as a share of their overall trade, it's going up. Um, again, the complementarities across those economies in basic goods, commodities, uh, agriculture, uh, manufacturing, and so forth, really able to fulfill each other's needs at affordable costs. So what used to be called South-South trade, or others cross-emerging market trade, or new Silk Roads, Afro-Eurasian trade, call it whatever you want, right? It now represents the better part of the... Um, of the uh, of the global trading, gro growth in global trade now already and in the future. And that centers very much on the Indian Ocean, right? Much more so than the Atlantic Ocean. And that's one of these, again, irrevocable shifts based upon today's demographics uh, and, and investments. So, again, a marketplace is a competitive arena, right? This may be happening and maybe no one can stop it, but there will be competition within this global system. And that's what I call the infrastructure arms race. Now, there are many uh, instances of the traditional kind of arms race going on in the world today. One need only look, obviously, at dynamics between the United States and China and the armament binge that's going on uh, to uh, replenish um, uh, the militaries of Western uh, nations as they confront Russia and so forth. So that's, that's what we think of with, arm, with an arms race. But there's also the infrastructure arms race. In a world in which we are relentlessly continuing to invest in all of this connectivity across borders and economies, um, a lot of that is the result of infrastructure investment. And an infrastructure investment has different, infrastructure arms race has a different dynamic, if you will, than this traditional arms race. And you can actually have a positive, uh, kick off a positive cycle of development through participating in an infrastructure arms race. And that's exactly what's happening right now. So I'll give you an example here. I mentioned that the Belt and Road Initiative was first announced in a sort of soft launch uh, 10 years ago. And at the time, we, very quickly, first it was dismissed, then it was vilified. And it was uh, project portrayed as a hegemonic plot to take over the world. And so in a fear of that, Western nations and their allies, such as Japan, really woke up. And you saw, you witnessed um, a raft of new measures. There's a lot of acronym soup on this slide. You don't have to memorize it all. Um, the United States passed the Strategic Competition Act, the Endless Frontier Act, the CHIPS Act, uh, efforts to uh, its own rival bank, the United States International Finance and Development Corporation, um, Mission Clean Network to convince countries uh, to pull Huawei out of their telecommunications networks. Um, the European Union announced its own, its own uh, a global gateway and connectivity project, uh, its own Indo-Pacific strategies to compete with China, um, Japan and India with their own infrastructure projects, the EU and Japan sustainable infrastructure finance initiative, resilient supply chain initiative between Japan, Australia, and India. At the G7 summit last summer, uh, they came up with their own acronym, B3W, Build Back Better World. Obviously, that was, uh, you know, maybe they hired... Um, you know, a good marketing agency, you know, give us three letters that competes with China's BRI, right? And they did. I think it's actually a pretty nifty acronym, right? Build Back Better World, a Partnership for Infrastructure Investment, and so on. How do we lower um, rates of finance for infrastructure projects to concessionary levels, make sure that China doesn't get those deals, and so forth? The only thing you need to remember from anything you see on this slide, because there's always there's a new announcement every week of some project to counter China. The only thing you need to remember is this. Not a single one of these acronyms and institutions existed five years ago. None of them existed five years ago. Right? And that's what you call an infrastructure arms race. Right? Where ten, if eight years ago we said, well, China is going to do all the infrastructure and it's going to buy up everything and that's the world is going to be, that's the challenge. We didn't take into account the response. And now you've got the response. And then you'll have the response to the response and you have the response to the response to the response. And that's how things work in a marketplace, right? And that's how an infrastructure arms race plays out. And you are sitting here and you should only be asking one question. How do I get the best deal for myself? Right? Now, coming from, from Asia, where I witness how the Philippines and Indonesia and Vietnam play this game, oh, they are so clever, right? And look at Saudi Arabia as well, saying on the one hand, we'll still do military deals with, uh, with the United States, but maybe we'll start to price oil in, uh, in RMB. Why not, right? 
And that's, and uh, the, you know, Indonesia will say, well, um, you know, we're going to, uh, you know, buy some warships from the U.S., but when it comes to our rail network that we need, let's see what the best bid is that we get from a Chinese uh, contractor, then let's play it off the Japanese one, right? The tech companies in Southeast Asia, which are growing into, uh, you know, Senta unicorns and listing all over the U.S. stock exchange and so forth, they're saying, hmm, why not have on my cap table uh, SoftBank from Japan, Tencent from China, some big European private equity, Google and Amazon too for good measure. Oh yeah, and some, and some government link companies too. Why not? Play all sides. The way you win the infrastructure arms race is not to kowtow to China or to America or to Europe or to India. It's to play all of them off each other to get the best deal for yourself, right? Wake up every day and say to yourself, you can't you're, you're, a price, you're a price taker, right, as one would say in, in market speak. You don't get to set the rules. You don't get to pick the winner, right? But you can play all the suitors off of each other to get the best deal for yourself and never go in just one direction because, again, amidst all that fluidity, there is a rigidity to the fact that it's going to always be this way. There's going to be multiple powers competing for your attention. Get the best deal from all of them. And so tying it all together, think about, of course, how can you learn those lessons from what Asians have done, right, which, and what Europe has done, to bring down barriers, to integrate further, build a Pax Africana, don't just talk about it, build it, right? I'm very supportive whenever I hear that African nations have decided that they're going to move towards a continent-wide free trade zone, a free labor mobility. Now, I know it's not going to happen overnight, right? none of these things do, but your eye is on the prize. Those are the right things to be doing. You see successful post-colonial regions do exactly those things. And it's the boring stuff of multilateral regional diplomacy. You know, in ASEAN in Southeast Asia, the Association of Southeast Asian Nations, there's no um, greater burden than having to attend an ASEAN summit. You'll instantly fall asleep. In Barack Obama's memoirs, he said, he reports having to go to one of those and, you know, drifting off to sleep. And he told his advisors, I will never go to an ASEAN summit ever again in my career, no matter how many terms I serve as president. But that's sometimes where important things get done, where they agree to commit uh, billions of dollars of collective capital through the African Development Bank or other associations towards bringing down those internal boundaries. Because especially in the continent with the largest number of countries, those borders are getting in your own way, right? So how do you invest in your own bilaterally, take advantage of Chinese and Indian investment to unscramble those borders of Africa? That's an extremely important objective uh, in order to be a more, again, as I said, to become a whole greater than the sum of the parts and to be a more confident player in this geopolitical marketplace. No one country can do it alone. Right now in Southeast Asia, con individual countries are trying to capture the supply chains coming out of China as a result of rising costs, geopolitical suspicions, and other sorts of uh, uh, trends. But Vietnam alone, no way. Thailand alone, no way. Philippines alone, no way. Only if they have their supply chains better integrated with each other can they represent a more attractive uh, market for investors to come into and move around. And of course, when I showed you that map of the Silk Roads of Eurasia, I emphasized how infrastructure investment, and population dynamics enable young populations to move into cities, right? And if you look at some of the forecasts around where uh, the largest cities in the world are going to be uh, in the coming decades as urbanization continues at such a rapid pace, well, here they are in the Afro-Eurasian space, and very much centered on uh, Africa as well. So, of course, infrastructure, which I've emphasized so much, doesn't repair itself, right? One has to continuously invest um, in the physical, the digital, the hard and the soft infrastructure that unlock your human potential, your human capital on this continent. So, investing domestically, investing internationally, drawing foreign capital, um, building or, or Improving the, the quality of life in cities of today and the emergent urban centers of tomorrow, that's what's happening right now. You can see it in Central Asia, you can see it in Southeast Asia, you can see it in Almaty, Kazakhstan, you can see it in New Delhi, you can see it in, uh, in, in Bangkok. You need to see that now happening all across Africa as well. That's a good way to spend money. And that's how you diver diversify your economies as well, right? To improve your resilience against shocks, uh, to, uh, to train the next generation 
to earn higher wages in the services economy, whether it is education, whether it's consumer products, even uh, basic commodities like agriculture, right? Investing in self-sufficiency as well as higher up the value chain. Uh, actually, a lot of those things fundamentally do depend on all of these different categories of infrastructure that I think of as the most significant investments that you can be making in the future. And also think about unlocking that mobility. Now, I mentioned not just bringing down borders with Africa, but thinking about uh, where the talent flows are in the world today. This map actually shows you what the kind of stable patterns of movement have been between regions of the world over the past couple of decades. Most migration has been Africans within Africa, South America to North, or Latin America to North America, Asians within Asia. In light of the demographic mismatch in the world today, in light of even climate change as well, just supply-demand you know, dynamics in the labor force, there will be uh, more Africans going abroad, they already are, more Asians moving north and west also. The largest number of annual new citizens in the United States are not Latin Americans, it's actually uh, Asians, primarily Indians, right, despite the vast distance. So think about the connectivity networks digitally, the remittances, and how they get used. So how do you ensure that there isn't more brain drain, but rather brain gain? And a final couple of points is that all of this contributes to systemic resilience. Resilience is a word that I heard in the opening video. It's a concept that a lot of people talk about, and it sounds great, but do you really understand how you get to it? How do you build resilience, not just talk about it? And the answer is actually very, very concrete. It's very tangible. It's more connectivity. Whether you're talking about physics or you're talking about geopolitics, connectivity is a very important pathway to resilience. Do you remember when that tanker ship got stuck in the Suez Canal? and it blocked all that trade, well, at least you could still sail across uh, or around Africa. It takes longer, sure. Um, you could put uh, containers onto trains and send them across Eurasia. You now have Arctic shipping opening up uh, over uh, Russia, right? The more of, these, of this connectivity that we build, the more pathways we build for supply to meet demand, for goods, services, people to get from point A to point B. And that is the nuts and bolts of resilience, a resilient system has many pathways to connect supply and demand uh, uh, across the world. So we have to continue to make, the, make those investments. We have to isolate the areas of vulnerability, of shock, whether it's Ukraine or Libya or Iran, whatever the case may be. Uh, make sure that those don't spill over and, uh, and take the world economy down with them. Build alternative pathways to any uh, crisis or hotspot in order to maintain that systemic uh, resilience. So the final point I'll make is that this all adds up to a whole new map of the world. As a geographer, I love nothing more than maps, and this is, this is, my, um, this is my final uh, slide and, and, and creation, my most recent construct of a map. And here, I put it all together into one. Here you have the entire world, you have every country, you see the borders in white, you see also all of the infrastructure relationships and connectivity and building, all the fiber optic internet cables. I have a friend who works for Google. I have a larger version of this hanging in my living room. He came over uh, and he said, wait, wait, hold on. Ah, yes, you've got the latest cable I just built, right? Uh, you know, we're building new, laying new internet cables all the time. Um, railways, pipelines, it's all here. What's it all for? What's the ethical normative agenda? What do we need to do? And the answer is, we need to realign our geographies. Right now, we live in a world where the geography of people, the geography of resources, the geography of infrastructure, the geography of borders are all out of place. They're all misaligned from each other. And that only gets highlighted as global warming uh, accelerates and climate change accelerates. And there is no summit, no United Nations, you know, no declaration that's going to solve that for us. No one is thinking in that big way. It's something that every one of you has to build. Every one of us has to be part of building a new map for the future in which we realign uh, resources, borders, infrastructure, and demographics. And so I, I distill all of this into just a, an agenda in two ways, two things that you can do if you want to actually contribute to a more resilient world. You can either move people to where the resources are, or you can move the technologies that are needed to where the people are. And that's it, one of those two things. If in your work, in your investment, your transactions, if you're moving people to resources or technology to people, you are contributing to this deep, long-term systemic process of realigning, improving our uh, geographic layering and building a more resilient world. If you're not, 
you certainly can. Everyone can. So I hope that that uh, inspires you, urges you towards action today. It was such a pleasure to be with you, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you so much. Thank you very much uh, for that very interesting perspective, quite unique in many ways. And I thought I'll pick up from one of the things you said in your presentation um, about Donald Trump, the former <laughs> U.S. president. If you had five minutes with our president, what might you ask him? Oh, that's a good one. Th this came up last night, actually, at dinner <laughs> in terms of the, uh, you know, the agenda for the country. And I was talking about some data in which uh, foreign investors have been surveyed um, over recent years and asked, what are the key criteria you look for when you're investing in an emerging market and frontier economy? And I think if I ask this question in the academic abstract, you might say, oh, well, investors want to see low corruption. They want to see an educated population, that kind of thing. Uh, actually, no. The number one, and this is year after year, survey after survey, market after market, the number one thing that foreign investors are looking for is a stable electricity supply. So I know that hits home, <laughs> right? I know that hits home, but it's, it's a, therefore exactly the appropriate answer because it's well documented as well uh, in, in the real you know, material world of finance and investment that you must stabilize your, your infrastructure, you must provide that foundation um, uh, of reliable, reliable uh, services, if you will, to power an economy in the literal sense of the term. So that would be one thing that I would bring up. We can, we can probably pause, stop with that, because let's get that right, <laughs> let's get that done, and then a lot of other things can build beyond that. Well, I'm pleased the Minister of Electricity is going to be joining <laughs> us a little later on, so that's something obviously every South African in this room worries about. Uh, some of the questions that have come through, this, this conversation about de-dollarization, do you anticipate that will happen and how quickly? Mm -hmm. By the way, I just want to say, as someone who was born in India, uh, who's in, and my wife's from Pakistan, and I'm in those countries a lot, this is, it's always not, not heartening, but whenever I hear people talking about load shedding, I'm like, oh, it's not only in India and Pakistan <laughs> where one talks about this. Uh, it's, it's elsewhere. But, but you obviously want to uh, you know, break, break free of that category. You don't want to be in that, in that, in that group of countries. De-dollarization is, is interesting. And, and uh, I'm going to put KU, my friend, on the spot because she's, she's next. And I know that she has a lot more to say about this uh, than I do. But I've been looking at these you know, relationships between um, you know, emerging countries that, that want to protect their political relationships and not have the you know, meddling of U.S. sanctions regime, that's one. You also have, again, the complementarity in these economies, and if, they're, and if their currencies are weak, they don't necessarily want to transact everything in U.S. dollars. And now you have the technological capability as a third factor that's enabling, uh, again, just a much more fluid and predictable, uh, you know, sort of um, uh, uh, trade relationships uh, amongst, uh, well, whether it's uh, linkages between central banks or between financial actors and financial systems and so forth. So you see the foundations are clearly in place in terms of the macroeconomic environment and trade, in the political and diplomatic environment given tensions, and the technological capability, and, and where you have countries where their economies or their currencies already trade within a relatively stable band, it's not a huge leap to imagine them tying it all together. And that's why you're seeing this sort of tipping point emerge, you know, where, where uh, clearly we've crossed a point of no return, where countries are not afraid to do it, uh, they're pursuing it. And I would say it's not in, it's not necessarily a bad thing, right? We need to have a transition towards, if you have a multipolar world, uh, it follows logically that you will have a, you know, multipolar, uh, you know, financial, uh, you know, system as well. And this is, this may be uncharted territory, but this is one of those journeys, you know, that, that the world is in, inevitably going to go through. I thought this was an interesting question on China and the idea that China doesn't necessarily subscribe to the Western idea of liberal democracy and individual choice. And the question that's being asked is, isn't that a powerful feature of what binds the West together? Um, I think that within the West, you have a whole lot of disparity, of the understanding of, you know, sort of, yeah, in theory, you could say, you could go back to Judeo-Christian traditions and you can say, yes, Western liberal democracy, but on the ground day to day, 
there's a lot of disparity, diversity, misunderstandings, you know, and the narcissism of minor differences, as it's known. You know, you, you don't meet many Western Europeans who look at the United States and view it as an enviable political system, right? Uh, I'm putting it charitably. Um, so, sure, on the one hand, there is common history and there's a de facto alliance, an institutionalized alliance, but what does it really mean in day-to-day -day life when you have, again, as I mentioned, European leaders tripping over themselves uh, to travel to, whether it's China or increasingly illiberal democratic states like India, to make those deals. So at the end of the day, I tend to think, uh, because it's true, uh, you know, values don't play as much of a role in the actual transactional you know, reality of, of diplomacy and certainly not in the economic domain and in the, in the, in the strategic domain. So we should focus on that rather than the kind of, um, you know, almost superficial values construct, which in the end is not actually shaping uh, our decisions. When it comes to Asia, it isn't just about China. In, in one of my previous books, I talked a lot about what I call the new Asian values. The Asian values um, kind of dogma of the 1990s, uh, before the Asian financial crisis, was centered around this idea of uh, Confucian societies, hierarchy, um, you know, it was basically, you know, semi-authoritarian, uh, you know, dictatorships, and in a way, an excuse for uh, some systemic corruption, you know, that was effectively excused by way of referring to these values. Today, you find that in Asia, across democracies and non-democracies, whether it's China or India, right, whether it is, and by the way, Asia, again, in the actual geographical definition, stretches to Israel all the way to the Philippines, right? What you find is that whether or not a society is democracy or not, there is, there are these emergent new Asian values. And one of them is a, a preference almost for technocratic kind of leadership, willing to give the executive a ver fairly long shelf life or runway to go ahead and, and focus on instituting a, a long-term vision, a national agenda for modernization, um, even if they have certain illiberal qualities. And again, you can see that with Modi in India, who's the most popular leader according to public opinion surveys, probably in the entire world today, despite the fact that he is reviled, resented, and feared, you know, not only in the country, but, uh, but in, amongst the diaspora. So um, technocratic uh, governance, uh, mixed capitalism, right, a, a strong role or hand for the state in the economy, not the kind of laissez-faire dogmatism that even the West no longer actually practices, um, and a certain social conservatism. You find this across democracies and non-democracies. This is actually what Chinese have in common with Indians, with Filipinos, with people in Thailand, Indonesia, Kazakhstan, Russia, you know, Iran, and so forth. If you could summarize, if you could even attempt to generalize um, the sentiments that animate uh, you know, five billion people worth of societies, I would actually, I would say, boil it down to those things. And so it's not actually just about whether they're politi their polit their political system, therefore, does not dictate how you view the world. And these deeper principles around a preference for a technocratic leader who gets things done, um, an acceptance that the government can have a very active and maybe even constructive role in the economy, and, and an incremental approach to liberalism, right? Even a bit of suspicion of going too far. Look at internet regulation, where now Western countries, you know, Anglo-American societies are saying, hold on a minute, maybe we need to have a bit of control over who gets to um, you know, shout fire in a crowded theater. Things are going more in the Asian direction than the reverse, but the Asian direction is not just a Chinese direction. It's something uh, deeper than that. Talking of that direction, is South Africa playing a good geopolitical or diplomacy game in terms of its own tilt towards Asia and away from the West? And what would that mean for a multipolar world BRICS and mm -hmm. all of that with more members applying? Mm -hmm. Well, so the, the, the key message that I'm you know, sharing today is don't think either or. Don't think I'm going to tilt towards Asia and away from the West. Multi-alignment, multi-alignment, multi-directional, not either or, both and. Right? You still have strong and positive relations with Western societies. You need to continue to exploit them in so many ways. You need it for investment. You need it for uh, where your students go and study. You need it for where the tourists come from. All of those things, you want to maintain that. Why would you sacrifice it? Why would you burn those bridges? But you've absolutely been a leader in embracing the new greater Indian Ocean uh, dynamics, which again, yes, China is an absolutely pivotal, vital part of that. But as you well know from your own history, India is a crucial uh, player in that too. And what we've witnessed in the past decade is that some of the doors that China has opened 
through large-scale infrastructure investment. It may have even abandoned some of those corridors, and Indian firms have moved in. Right? You can see it in, in, uh, in, in, um, in Central Africa, you can see it in the Horn of Africa, and of course you have a long history of an Indian population here as well, much like East Africa does. So to me, um, it's vital to, you, you, again, you cannot control what China is going to decide its next African policy is going to be, right? And so you should not rely on it. You should not rely on Europe reforming its common agricultural policy. You should not rely on who the next president of the United States is because God knows I don't know either, <laughs> right? So you must always be prepared to play all sides. Well, I think it's been a fascinating conversation. Thank you very Thank much you. for your presentation. Thank you. Everybody. Folks, one more round of applause. Thank you. Thank you. Great.